On January 7th, 2024, the African Cup of Nations kicked off in Cote d'Ivoire. What we didn't know then was we was about to witness one of the greatest tournaments in living memory with one of the best comebacks in footballing history. From red cards to penalties to late goals to giant killers to major shocks and to multiple managers losing their job mid-competition. AFCON 2023 really had it all. So join me as we take an exploration through one of the best stories in African football history. The story of AFCON 2023. We begin our story in Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire. A festival of football awaits with the fans bringing the colour, the flair, the passion that a tournament of this magnitude deserves. The opening match of the tournament sees the hosts Côte d'Ivoire take on the minnows of Guinea-Bissau. Africa's top former footballers line the perimeter of the stadium in a wait of this tournament beginning. We are treated to a 2-0 victory for the hosts. An expected result, but one that would not be a foreshadowing of the tournament to come whatsoever. Let's go group by group, telling the story of the most infatuating group stage in living memory of any recent tournament. Starting with Group A, containing the host Côte d'Ivoire, Equatorial Guinea, Guinea-Bissau and Nigeria. Expectation is that the hosts and the Super Eagles of Nigeria will dominate this one. After the opening matches, we know that Ivory Coast got off to the perfect start, winning 2-0 over Guinea-Bissau, whereas Equatorial Guinea and Nigeria played out a draw. The second game saw Ivory Coast fall to a 1-0 defeat to Nigeria and Equatorial Guinea defeat Guinea-Bissau 4-2. Which left the group looking as such. The Ivory Coast just needed a draw against Equatorial Guinea to qualify for the next round. But this is where the AFCON madness begun. Equatorial Guinea 4, Ivory Coast nil. An upset for the ages, Cote d'Ivoire torn apart by a 34-year-old Spanish third division right back in Emilio Ensue, which put him on five goals for the tournament. It left the hosts on three points with the most horrendous goal difference. In any of the previous three AFCONs, this would have been enough for Ivory Coast to be eliminated from the tournament. Would this be the case here though? Group B had Cape Verde, Egypt, Ghana and Mozambique. Cape Verde and their half a million population won the group comfortably with Man United legend Bebe starring throughout the group stage. Egypt drew every match 2-2 and were majorly uninspiring throughout but that was still enough for them to finish in second. But they took an even bigger loss still when Mo Salah hobbled off at half time against Mozambique. Ghana under Chris Hewton finished in third without a win, which saw them knocked out alongside Mozambique, who finished bottom. It genuinely looked at points that Egypt, Ghana and Mozambique were all trying their best to finish bottom. Group C has Cameroon, Guinea, Senegal and the Gambia. Senegal were fantastic through the group. They dominated every single match and looked like they hadn't really expended too much energy. The comeback from Cameroon from finishing bottom to end up finishing second was utterly bonkers. With five minutes to go, they were heading out, finishing bottom of the group, whilst Guinea and the Gambia were going through. However, an equaliser in the 87th minute and a winner in the 91st saved the day for them and ended in second. Guinea were also fortunate enough to qualify from third in this group. Group D consisted of Algeria, Angola, Burkina Faso and Mauritania. Starting with the group winners Angola, they were strong throughout, utterly deserved their first place finish in the group. Algeria though, what a fall from grace. They looked defeated before they'd even kicked the ball at the tournament. Compounded by a defeat to Mauritania, who picked up their first AFCON win in that match. This was an astonishing achievement from a nation which a decade earlier was unable to even fulfill matches due to a lack of players. At the conclusion of this match, it looked like the Ivory Coast alongside Ghana and Algeria were heading out of the competition. Three major players being out this early would have been utterly insane. Group E had Mali, Namibia, South Africa and Tunisia. Certainly the least eventful group, but a fun one all the same. Mali for me were the best team to watch through the group stage. They played great passing 
football, but sometimes were a little bit lacking in the ruthless department. South Africa finished in second and became some people's surprise package for the later rounds. Third was another nation who picked up their first ever AFCON win when they beat Tunisia, who thus finished bottom of the group. North Africa has really underperformed at this AFCON so far. Group F rounded out the groups that saw Morocco top the group, the Congo in second, Zambia in third, and Tanzania in fourth. The impact of this though was tenfold. A 1-0 victory for Morocco over Zambia in the final match saw Cote d'Ivoire sneak through by the skin of their teeth despite that horrendous 4-0 loss to the Equatorial Guinea. The four best third place teams qualified through the group and the Ivory Coast were the worst of those four. Elsewhere, one match into this group, the Tanzania manager said Morocco were in bed with the Football Federation and got banned for the rest of the tournament, which was certainly an interesting tactic to say the least. Fortunately for them, they came last. So the groups were truly mesmerising. The football has been of a really great standard and the matches have been mostly entertaining. And just as we're heading into the knockout round, some absolutely absurd news has broken. Cote d'Ivoire have sacked their manager despite still being active in the tournament. Attempts to loan two-time AFCON winning manager Herve Renard were scuppered when the French Football Federation said no to the offer. I mean, that would have been the most Herve Renard thing of all time parachuting into the tournament halfway through, winning it, then walking off into the sunset. Alas, former Reddy midfielder Emmers Fay will take temporary charge instead. The group stage has been beautiful carnage, so let's see what the knockouts will bring us. With the insanity of the group stage behind us, the serenity of the last 16 would surely follow. It hasn't quite worked out like that. Angola Namibia was our first match in the last 16. The former had been superb in the group, one of the real shining nations of the opening stage. Namibia, on the other hand, suffered the embarrassment of a 4-0 loss to South Africa, but beating Tunisia in their only AFCON win to date was enough to send them through. This match was a barnstormer. Just 17 minutes in, Angola were reduced to 10 men, following the dismissal of their goalkeeper, who got overzealous and handled the ball outside of his area. This didn't seem to phase Angola at all though, because by half time they were 2-0 up. They had been slightly helped by a second yellow to Namibian defender Hulkongo just before the break though. 10v10 in the second half did not favour Namibia one bit, who ended up conceding a third in a 3-0 loss. An eventful start to the last 16. In the match later that day, Nigeria took on Cameroon for a place in the quarterfinals. Cameroon, who had managed that incredible fight back in the group stage to qualify with two last minute goals, appeared to have used their miracle allowance up in this matchup. Nigeria were comfortably better without being as potent as they could have been, with a 2 0 victory with both goals coming from Adamola Lukman. The next day brought us the ultimate Guinea derby between Equatorial Guinea and regular old normal Guinea. Normal and regular could also be how you could describe the first half of this one, but the second half brought more of the AFCON chaos. In the 55th minute, Equatorial Guinea's Federico Bicoro lost his head entirely when he planted a studded challenge onto the stomach of Mohamed Bayo. Despite this though, just minutes later, Equatorial Guinea were awarded a penalty and you would have been extremely confident when Emilio and Sue, the man with five goals already in this tournament, stepped up to take it. Incredibly though, he put his penalty wide at the worst possible moment. And as the minutes looked on, the game looked destined for extra time. Until the 98th minute when Bayo with stud marks on his tummy knocked home the winner. Equatorial Guinea, who had been such giant killers in the group finishing ahead of Nigeria and Cote d'Ivoire, were out in the last 16. Next up was Egypt versus DR Congo, where someone's O had to go. Yes, remarkably, this matchup saw two nations who had both drawn every match at the tournament so far. Surely this matchup wouldn't also end in a draw, it ended in a draw. Yes, the two sides played out a 1-1 draw that ran all the way to penalties, where even then it looked like the two nations couldn't be split. It took 18 penalties to split them, which led to both goalkeepers taking spot kicks, where DR Congo scored, and Egypt's missed sending them home. It had been an unbelievably bad tournament for the Pharaohs who had come in as one of the favourites with people suggesting maybe it's finally Mo Salah's time to win an AFCON but they didn't even manage to win one match here. The following day kicked off with two major underdogs facing off Cape Verde and Mauritania. 
The journey for Mauritania to reach this position deserves more than just a few lines on a script, so watch this space. Back to the match though, and this one was an incredibly tight affair with chances for both sides being squandered. But once again, just as the match was looking set for extra time, a goal struck. Ryan Mendes fired home a penalty after being felled in the penalty area. It was cruel for Mauritania, but what a journey they had been on. The progress they have made in the last couple of decades will live long in the story of their nation. Late that day, we come to Senegal versus Cote d'Ivoire, the holders and favourites for the competition facing off against a nation that would not die in the group stage. When Senegal took the lead just four minutes in, it seemed obvious that they would head through and the hosts were finally heading out of the competition. But no, they equalised with five minutes to go from the penalty spot keeping this one alive and sending the match to extra time. No goals could be found and therefore penalties would have to separate these two. Only one penalty was missed in this shootout and it was by Senegal's Moussa Niakate, sending them home and the deaf cheaters Cote d'Ivoire through once again. Senegal in this match were so complacent, almost to the point of laziness. And I do wonder whether, due to the high proportion of their players now playing in the Saudi league and that lack of intensity over there, whether that carried through to this AFCOM. Nevertheless, the miracles kept coming for Cote d'Ivoire. In the penultimate match of the last 16, we saw Mali take on Burkina Faso. As I've already stated, Mali have impressed me throughout the tournament through their lovely passing football under manager Eric Schell. Burkina Faso have been less infatuated with, but they always have quality with the likes of Bertrand Traore in attack. The match got off to a flyer here when Edmund tapped sober, knocked home a quite frankly comical own goal to put Mali ahead. The lead was doubled early in the second half for a Sinayoko strike. He, for me, has been one of the best players at this tournament. Burkina Faso did halve the deficit shortly after through a dubious penalty decision and thought they were in dreamland late on when it appeared they had nodded home an equaliser only for VAR to rule it out for offside. Mali were through to the quarters and a date with the hosts. The final of our last 16 matches was another absolute corker. Morocco, many people's favourites going into the tournament, were taking on South Africa, who many saw as potential surprise package. If North Africa was having a bad tournament so far, it was about to get a hell of a lot worse. South Africa took a shock lead in the 57th minute after Morocco had been incredibly wasteful. Morocco pushed for an equaliser and looked set to get one when they got a penalty just moments before time, but Hakimi stepped up and blasted it against the crossbar. From here, Morocco really lost their heads. Just minutes later, Sofran Amrabat was sent off and a second was found for South Africa through McQuayna. And just like Egypt, Algeria and Tunisia before them, Morocco were out. Again, the last 16 has been unbelievably fun. Twists at every turn, passion from all participating nations, and shocks left, right, and center. An astonishing fact to reference at this point is that the eight quarter finalists in AFCON 2023 are a completely different eight to AFCON 2021. It really does show the absurdity of this competition, but also the closeness of quality between nations. Eight teams now remain. The quarterfinals are next. So here we are then at the quarterfinal stage where it all starts to feel very real. Nigeria would take on Angola in the first of four clashes. The Super Eagles had been very defensively resilient throughout the tournament, but struggled to create many goals. Angola were the surprise overachievers at this point and were looking to go as far as they possibly could. The match itself was a rather rigid affair given the increased stakes here, but the two teams were separated by one goal and it came from that man once again, Ademola Lukman, who dispatched to send Nigeria through to the semis and Angola home. Later that day, we saw DR Congo take on Guinea. Both teams had been surprise winners in the last 16 and the semi-final beckoned for both of them. Despite Guinea taking an early lead in this one through Mohamed Bayo, they were second best throughout as DR Congo recovered to win by three goals to one. The nation had failed to qualify for the last four in 2021, but here they were in the last four. Day two of the quarterfinals began with yet another game of the tournament contender involving 
Cote d'Ivoire. They took on Mali in this one, who I have been very complimentary about throughout this tournament. And this was evident yet again in this one as Mali controlled vast swathes of possession. They were also aided by a second yellow card for Kosanu in the first half that sent Ivory Coast down to 10 men. And with 20 minutes left, Mali found the first goal through Nene in one of the potential goals of the tournament. And finally, and I mean finally, it looked like Cote d'Ivoire were heading out of the tournament at last. But yet again, they managed to strike back. Simon Adingra's poacher's finish to save the Ivorians once more came in the 93rd minute. And with that, the game headed to extra time where no goals could separate either side. Until yet again, Cote d'Ivoire found a winner in the 122nd minute as Seko Fafana fired a shot goalwards that Umar Diakite turned into the net. In the most unbelievable of circumstances, the Ivory Coast had found a way through yet again. It really cannot be understated how utterly absurd it was that Cote d'Ivoire just managed to keep going and keep going and keep going. In the aftermath, Diakite, the scorer of that winner, was sent off for taking his shirt off, and when the final whistle sounded, chaos ensued. Mali were absolutely enraged. Hamari Traore was sent off for attempting to physically assault the referee. Meanwhile, Mali manager Eric Schell appeared to be getting waterboarded by a member of his coaching team. Somehow though, Mali were out and Cote d'Ivoire had more lives than a cat. In the final quarterfinal match, we panned over to Cape Verde versus South Africa. This match had oodles of chances throughout, but neither side could find them there. This match was especially enjoyable when Bebe came on off the bench and proceeded to shoot every single time he got the ball, with not one of them hitting the target. In the end though, the match ran through all the way to penalties, where we saw a goalkeeping masterclass from South African keeper Romway Williams. He saved four out of five Cape Verde penalties and was fingertips away from the other. Despite his nation doing their best to also miss theirs too, South Africa prevailed, reaching the last four for the first time since 2000. The tournament just did not stop delivering in the quarterfinals. It feels almost inevitable at this point that no one can stop Cote d'Ivoire. Nothing can stop them. They should already have been out in the group stage. They then should have gone out in the last 16 and they should have gone out here in the quarterfinals. And at this point, you're thinking, they're going to go all the way. They're going to go all the way. But the other three nations will be vying to be the spoilers to the host party. Let's see what madness awaits in the semi-finals. With a few days rest for the nations, we now headed to the semi-finals. The trophy glistened in the eyes of the players in this one. They were desperate to reach the final. Two matches to come feature the Super Eagles of Nigeria taking on Bafana Bafana, aka South Africa, and the host Cote d'Ivoire versus the Leopards of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Let's find out what happened next. We begin with Nigeria and South Africa. The former were very much the favourites, but the latter were definitely enjoying their underdog status. The first half to this one was a cagey affair with chances few and far between. The second, though, kick-started into life. South Africa controlled the possession, but Nigeria were deadly on the counter, and that's how they took the lead. Osimhen burst into the box, only to be felled, resulting in a Nigerian penalty. Truste Kong stepped up, sending his penalty underneath the underside of Romway Williams. The game ticked on, and in the 89th minute, Nigeria thought they had sealed it when Osimem tapped home from close range, only for the goal to be brought back for a South African penalty instead. This was converted by Toboho Makwena in the 90th minute, adding another late goal for this tournament, sending the match to extra time. In the additional 30 minutes, a red card was displayed for South Africa, but a winner could not be found by either side, and thus penalties would once again decide the winner at this AFCON. Now, this was especially interesting as both goalkeepers had been the two best of the tournament, Stanley Nuabali for Nigeria and Ronwen Williams for South Africa. Both of them provided saves in the shootout, but it was the Super Eagles that progressed, with Kelechi Ihinacho providing the winning penalty. Nigeria were heading to the final, and sadly South Africa had to settle for the bronze final. 
The later semi-final saw the hosts Ivory Coast somehow still in this tournament taking on DR Congo. Surprisingly, this match was the less eventful of the two semi-finals. The first half saw Cote d'Ivoire control proceedings but did not find an early goal. This was a far cry from Ivory Coast's other two knockout matches where they had been second best throughout. Sebastian Allaire, the striker for the Elephants, always looked to be the danger man, having missed a point-blank header in the first half. He atoned for this in the second, though, when his looped volley drops into the net, sending the stadium into rapturous celebration. From here, it was all about completing a professional job for Cote d'Ivoire, which hadn't always been their signature move in this competition, to say the least, but they managed it well here. It had proven to be a match too far for the DR Congo, who had been excellent up until this point, but could not really get going in this match. But for Cote d'Ivoire, the team that everyone thought was out in the group stage was heading to the final. The semis once again provided late drama, a red card, penalties, etc., but surprisingly, Cote d'Ivoire was not actually involved in any of this. The story feels like it's building in towards a, a major Cote d'Ivoire win, an absolutely monumental triumph against the odds, but they'll be facing tricky, tricky customers in Nigeria. Let's not forget too that these two met in the groups where the Super Eagles were comfortably the better side, but this is now a very, very different Ivory Coast. Before we come to the final, we first have the third placed playoff, as known in AFCON as the bronze final between DR Congo and South Africa. Generally, I'm not really a big fan of these type of matches. I think the supporters are pretty lethargic for these type of events, as well as the players just sort of want it all over and done with. But in this case, it did really feel like a celebration of two nations who had majorly overperformed. The match itself was devoid of goals throughout, mostly due to the wastefulness of DR Congo, and instead, it ran through to penalties. Ronwen Williams had proven himself to be very adept at saving spot kicks throughout, and this proved to be no different as South Africa won the final 6-5 on penalties. But nonetheless, this was a great tournament for both nations who can take a lot of encouragement going into future events and maybe looking to qualify for the next World Cup. So here we were then in Abidjan, an unforgettable month-long festival of African football was coming to a close, but first we had to crown a winner. Nigeria came into the final having been extremely defensively resilient throughout the tournament, and despite not creating oodles of chances throughout, when they needed it, their quality shone through. Cote d'Ivoire, on the other hand, had been on a monstrous journey to end up at this point. When they lost their final group match 4-0 to Equatorial Guinea, they looked out. Remarkably though, they squeezed through as the worst third place team to qualify, sack their manager and appointed Emers Fay as their interim manager in his first managerial job. Since then, the Elephants have tiptoed their way to the final, defeating Senegal on penalties, beating Mali in the final minute of extra time and comfortably defeating DR Congo. The two nations also met in the group stage where Nigeria were comfortably better in that occasion, but this is now a very, very different Cote d'Ivoire side. Was it the hosts? or the Super Eagles that triumphed. The game kicked off to a raucous atmosphere from the home fans who had really gone through the ringer throughout the tournament but remained in superb voice. The Elephants dominated the ball and the chances in the first half, but it was Nigeria who struck first. Despite creating next to nothing for the first half hour, a corner from Alex Iwobi ricocheted into the air and was met by Nigerian captain William Truste Kong. The crowd were silenced 
as Nigeria went into half time 1 0 up. The second half saw Cote d'Ivoire emerge with even greater intent, and they were in the ascendancy from the off. Breakthrough struck on the hour mark as Frank Kessie headed home from the corner, where he was left completely unmarked. The crowd were once again lifted and were right behind their team. Late drama had been a running theme throughout the tournament, but when Sebastian Allaire scored in the 81st minute to put Cote d'Ivoire ahead, that actually felt rather early. Alas, though, Cote d'Ivoire had found themselves in front with Allaire's flick at the near post, sailing into the far corner, sending the supporters into raptures. Despite late rallies from the Super Eagles, they couldn't muster up an equaliser. And thus, the winner of this African Cup of Nations 2023 would be Cote d'Ivoire in one of the most remarkable tournaments in living memory. Reflecting on the tournament now the dust has settled, I can only express what a magnificent journey it really has been. From day one to day 29, it really has been unbelievable drama, tension, and just fabulous football on display. The group stage saw the hosts nearly defeated, only to survive by the skin of their teeth. It saw Ghana, Tunisia, Algeria finish bottom of their respective groups. It saw Mauritania and Namibia pick up their first AFCON wins. It saw the Tanzania manager banned for the rest of the tournament for alleging corruption between Morocco and the Confederation of African Football. It had a 34-year-old Spanish third division right back leading the scoring charts, who by the way did end up finishing as top scorer. It really was great fun. The start of the knockout saw more of that same intensity, the immense drama we had witnessed throughout, only this time with added penalty shootouts. In the last 16, we saw Egypt knocked out by DR Congo, ending their tournament without a win. We saw Cape Verde reach the last eight. We saw Morocco also knocked out, surprisingly, to South Africa, ending a dismal tournament for North Africa as a whole. And we saw the host Cote d'Ivoire beat Senegal on penalties, having equalised right at the end of the 90. The quarterfinals brought us the match of the tournament between the Elephants and Mali as Cote d'Ivoire came from 1-0 down to win 2-1 with goals in the 90th minute and the 122nd minute. Both DR Congo and South Africa advanced to the semis, but it was here where it really became a story of the redemption arc of the host Cote d'Ivoire. As they overcome unbelievable amounts of adversity under their new manager, MS Fay to win the African Cup of Nations despite only leading for 50 minutes throughout the whole knockout stage. For just under four weeks, it was unmissable action. But to end, I don't want to talk about the penalties or the drama or the red card or the managerial upheaval. I don't want to talk about any of that. I want to talk about something a little bit different. I want to first praise the fantastic broadcasters who commentated on this tournament. Robbie Nock and Mark Gleason especially were superb and brought the tournament to life. I want to praise the referees, not just on the pitch, but also in the VAR room, who made mostly tremendous decisions throughout the tournament in incredibly quick time. And lastly, I have to praise the fans who brought so much passion and life to these proceedings. Cote d'Ivoire may be the winners of the tournament, but they were also sublime hosts who delivered a tournament that will be remembered for decades to come. For now though, I just want to say thank you all so much for watching this one. If you did enjoy and you wouldn't mind leaving a like, that would be fantastic. And if you want to see more, make sure to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.